I mean, it is genuinely jaw, jaw dropping. This story is not only massive, but it's really bizarre as well to be phoning a 78 year old at three in the morning, essentially saying that you've been kidnapped. Quite senior Tories were texting last night, just saying simply, can we not just go one week without one of these scandals? Hello and welcome to The Political Forecast. This week, a Tory MP is suspended after claims that he used campaign funds to pay off what he called bad people. But is it actually Westminster that's filled with bad people after a succession of scandals? Joining me to discuss it is Channel 4 News senior political correspondent Paul McNamara and two people with their own experiences of a toxic culture at Westminster. Mari Black is the SNP's deputy leader in the Commons. She's stepping down at the next election, saying that Westminster is one of the most unhealthy workplaces. Justine Greening was Theresa May's education secretary and also minister for women and equality. She lost the Conservative whip after voting against Boris Johnson's Brexit plans. Welcome to you all. Let me start with you, Paul. Fill us in on the very latest. Yeah, this one's quite the marmalade dropper. And I'll, I'll start all of it with Mr Menzies strongly disputes all these allegations. That will settle our lawyers. Um, OK, so this story, the details are really quite spectacular on this one. So according to The Times, Mr Menzies calls up his former campaign manager at 3.15 in the morning, this was last December, saying that he was locked in a flat uh, and he needed £5,000 to, quote, pay bad people. And it was a matter of, quite quote, life and death. The sum was reportedly paid later that morning. I think the numbers had risen by this point to £6,500. Again, this is all according to the Times reporting, and that the office manager was then reimbursed from So she campaign. paid it out of her own pocket. So she pays out of her own pocket, allegedly because he didn't have the funds to pay for it himself. And then later on, she was paid from campaign money. Right. Yeah. She was paid back from campaign money. And apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, the campaign staff, the local staff say, don't worry about it. You know, we'll, we'll cover these costs from campaign funds. According to the Times. According to the Times. Yes. I mean, he denies. you always know how big a story is when your phone starts pinging at 11 p.m. at night and how senior the person is who's texting you. And quite senior Tories were texting last night. And the, the first one I got from my senior was just FFS, which I believe stands for for flips sake. Yes. Uh, and then this morning, again, get a few messages. One of them coming, coming this morning just saying simply, can we not just go one week without mm. one of these scandals? Do we know who these bad people or bad hombres, as uh, Donald Trump would say, were? I am unaware of who these bad hombres are. Right. OK, good, <laughs> good, good one. I like that. Um, Justine, I mean, it's not the first time we've heard about Sleaze in what was once your party in the House of Commons. Uh, but this one is quite different, isn't it? I mean, it's a sort of layer cake of different things going on here. I mean, I woke up today and saw the story. And I mean, it is genuinely jaw, jaw dropping. I mean, it's probably worth reiterating that it's a story in the Times. Um, no doubt people will be trying to get all of the, the actuality, the details behind it. And Mark Menzies has said, he's said, none of this is true from what I can say. See, Strongly disputes. Strongly disputes. And, and I think you have to say that as well, because at this stage, yeah. as we record, it's that front page story, but it, in a sense, it's not <clears throat> developed. But I do think... Um, in a parliament when we've seen all sorts of stuff yeah. happening, it was jaw-dropping to see this in particular. And I've and never why seen anything. Why this? Because, because it involved funds? not just it, it involved it's a story that isn't just about behaviour, but then brings in a local party yeah. um, in a way that I, I genuinely haven't seen before. So it's so it, it sort of pulled in apparently, you know, 78 year olds know. at three in the morning. Three in the morning. You yep. can't make that, you can't that make up, up in a sense. Yep. That was my, and, my sense. And the me. other little detail here is that apparently the Tory party's known about this for Since three January. months, yep. right? But, and I think it was Grant Chaps this morning who said, well, um, new, new things have come to light. And, and, it was, and as a result of that, we decided to uh, withdraw the whip from Mark Menzies. Okay. I mean, but late, I think you could the argue. New, the new things that came to light was the times were reporting, <laughs> yes. I imagine. Um, but uh, I mean, like Justine says, this story is 
not only massive, but it's really bizarre as well. Because, like you say, to be phoning a 78-year-old at three in the morning, essentially saying that you've been kidnapped yeah. unless somebody pays this ransom... The poor it's woman, so what bizarre. must she have been thinking? I mean, uh -huh. I wonder what he actually allegedly said thinking, her. Matt. What was she allegedly thinking? Allegedly <laughs> thinking, of course, yeah. Um, but also, there's something about why was that the person to call almost? I mean, I think, I think it, it, you know, it gets you into this lifestyle mm. question on MPs in terms mm. of how isolating that role mm -hmm. ends up being for some people who go into Parliament. OK, we don't just want to dwell on uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Mark Menzies. We want to broaden it out a little bit to the toxic culture of Westminster, which you've talked about a lot. So you have decided mm -hmm. to leave Westminster precisely because of this? If, of the entire culture that Westminster exists in, yes. And, and of the entire culture that you really, you know, that was enough for you to actually quit Parliament. Yep. Was this the worst part of it, or is it more than that? Um... No, I, I would say that this is the biggest factor, certainly. Um, you know, I, I've said before that me choosing to stand down at the next election in many ways is death by a thousand cuts. You know, there's lots of different mm. aspects that all add up, but by far and away the biggest one is absolutely the culture of Westminster and the, the sort of environment that it fosters. And I, I think... Describe how that works, though. I mean, because so, you know, lot, the, the public probably thinks you know MPs are elected. They you know they they start off because of public service. They get into the yeah. House of Commons, and then what does it feel like? Is it like some big sort of boarding I mean, house? It's is, actually, it, is it a bit dingy? What what, what 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 creates that culture? It's what Justine said there. Um, struck home is it's isolating because you're in a, a place where. Uh, to a large extent, folk are out to get you all the time. Folk mm. are out to catch you out. Folk, even on your own side, mm. can stick the daggers in. So you're suddenly existing in a way where you're, to an extent, paranoid all the time and wondering, have you got a, you know, a, a, a specific incentive or a mm. different motive for asking me that? Are you telling people what I'm saying? So it, it leads you to almost have a an element of secrecy mm. because you don't want to expose yourself too much because someone might use it against you. Justin, you were stabbed in the front by Boris Johnson, <laughs> not in the back. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Well, but, but does, this, does this chime with your experience of Westminster when you I, first joined? I remember doing an interview with The Guardian literally the morning after I got elected and I had not slept all night. I was the first Conservative seat that we won that year in 2005. And I remember saying to them, I'm too normal to be an MP. You know, maybe I should take up Chinese knife throwing. Or I made some kind of joke about it. <laughs> made some, stuff. Exactly, exactly. That's what I mean. You know, yeah. maybe that's what I need to do to sort of fit in yeah. with this bizarre group of yeah. people that I'm, I'm now going to join in the House of Commons. Yeah. But I think, I think I was definitely onto something. And and the issue, Matt, is actually yes, most MPs do go in wanting to make a massive difference to their mm. communities. They're, I mean, I'm so driven by social mobility. Yeah. This is what I'm working on outside of parliament. But actually there's definitely a core that are incredibly well networked and they take that network in. Mm -hmm. So whereas I was someone who turned up at parliament that day in May after I got elected and I'd only been there about two or three times before. And you For were both, other people, you were, very, you were the youngest Tory MP, weren't you? I was you? the youngest Tory MP. I was one of only 16 shockingly female yeah. Tory MPs. And you were the youngest MP ever it's, in the history yeah, of, I think of so. democracy. Yeah. Yeah. Extraordinary. <laughs> but I think there's a group of, there's, there's a part of parliament that is exceptionally well networked. It's the mm -hmm. exact opposite maybe to the world that we experience. Mm -hmm. And I think at the beginning, you don't necessarily realise that. Mm -hmm. But after a while, you start to think, yeah, they're, they're all getting together. Mm -hmm. And and there are groups maybe that you're not in, and and I think that's maybe where you start to have out? a sense of um, there's a, there's a, there's there's part of Parliament that's leading a different life, I think, to almost the rest of Parliament, and I think mm -hmm. then you get a group in the middle where it's just very very isolating. So, and which is the part of Parliament leading the different life? Who are these people? I think these are people who've known one another for years because either they've always been involved in politics or they went to the same school. I was just about to say. Right. Or they maybe were part of a Which union school would movement. would that be, I wonder? Time, obviously, <laughs> our elite private schools. For those people, coming into Parliament is a completely different experience because it is simply an extension yep. of their latest mm. environment that they've all been in together since year dot. For people like me, yep. and I guess it's the same for you, mm. 
this was a completely new world. And so you're thrown into it, learning a new job. In, in both our cases, yep. we won seats. So you've got no team, you've got to build your team, yep. you've got to literally learn about being an MP, representing your patch, doing casework. It's such a different experience. I mean, people often talk about the Tory party as a, you know, either a boys club or a succession of boys clubs or an old school club or whatever. What about the SNP? Are there clubs within the SNP? I think to an extent, yes, because you have to remember that before 2015, the SNP was considered quite a sort of fringe rebellious mm. party. So... A lot of the folk who are, are in the SNP and have been for, say, 30 years, they all know each other because they could all fit in a room at one point. But <laughs> you did know? you feel like an outsider when you joined that group in Parliament? No, but only because of the membership burst that came after the Scottish independence yeah. referendum. It meant that the old guard were the minority in their own party. You know, the vast majority of members we're all in the same boat as me and that we've not been doing this for as long as you guys. I want to go back to something. Like when you're bringing this up, I mean, you're saying like it's death by a thousand cuts. I'm sure like you've mentioned this to the party yep. time and time again, different things. Hmm. What do they do? Is there any outreach? Is there any, when you're bringing up, you know, all these little yeah. know, microaggressions or, 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 or just little mini moments? Yeah. I, th I think there's there's an element of... Because political parties are responding to things on a daily basis, yeah. I think it's one thing that all political parties have to get better at doing is having some kind of structure or institution mm -hmm. by which you can keep one eye on the long game, you know, so that you can see, wait a minute, there's trends here. Why are we suddenly only getting guys coming in? Why are we only getting a majority of folk in private schools? Why are we, you know, eat, to keep an eye on these things whilst you can have the other side doing the day-to-day -day stuff with the politics? So I, I do think it's something that all parties need to get better at. Were you ever tempted by potentially pursuing that role yourself? No, because I value my hair too much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, come back in a couple of years, and I might, I might think differently. But at the minute, no chance. <laughs> and, and, all, and, and also, you know, in the pursuit of fairness, there is at least one SNP mm -hmm. member parliament. Yeah, no, the Tories don't have a monopoly on this. Absolutely, although, absolutely, it's yeah. it's across the board. And I think, as well, if I can be a bit nuanced here, not to justify uh, anything, uh, you know, corrupt or scandalous, but. It always strikes me how often these scandals revolve around men with men, especially when they're sexual mm. scandals. And <clears throat> that I could be way off the mark here, but part of my understanding of that is there's an element of shame in those folks' mm. heads where this is something I need to hide and something that will be used against me. And that, again, chimes back into that isolating nature where... Parliament is a difficult place to ask for help mm. or to ask for support because you're essentially admitting weakness and vulnerability and that's just a no-go in Westminster. Do you agree with what Barry said there about the, the men with men, that, that that is a particular problem, especially perhaps in the Tory party? It, it, it could be. I think the issue about... Parliament's a very odd place because on the one hand, you've got these 650 people, you're mm. all grouped into natural groupings, political yeah. parties... You have a lot of friendships across the house, actually, where you've got common interests. But at the same time, you're on your own. Yeah. Because you have your constituency. Mm -hmm. You're the person representing your patch. And actually, no one else is there to do that other than you. So it's this weird combination of being part of a team, mm. but ultimately, mm. there is a sense mm. from many people that it's every man for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so those two things just pull against one another so, the whole so time. So who do you call if you've, if you've got a problem, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you have a real problem, either it's an emotional problem or you think you're being blackmailed. Who can you call at Westminster without landing yourself in a lot of trouble with the whips? Well, I think one of the, I mean, the whips probably are at the heart of this. I, I remember when I first got there, I used to joke that I used to call them a human resource department with the human bit taken out. <laughs> but I think because, it, because effectively, you know, there is no group, if you like, within each party. There's no that, pastoral care. It, it, there is no, that generally would happen through the whips, but of course they're conflicted because yep. what they really need to do mm. is make sure you're at that vote at that time. Mm. And so you almost need to recognise that in any other walk of life, and I spent 15 years in, 
mm-hmm. business and industry before I became an MP. I hadn't planned to have a political career. I had never seen organisations run like this to the extent that, you know, for the whips looking at who's going to do what role, yeah. no sense of anyone's CV yep. or what they're interested in or what they might be but good also, at. But Much what about checks and balances? You know, an, a, a, you know a, a genuine HR department mm-hmm. that says, well, hang on a minute, you know, you're doing this, you shouldn't Absolutely. be doing that. You've got, you know, um, the famous black book, you know, well, you full might of all get sorts some of feedback secrets. On, on, you know, how you get better, how you yeah. develop. Yeah. That doesn't you know, exist. I would say there's none of that that goes on, and that's because mm-hmm. it's this issue of first among equals. There's people yeah. who want your role. Yep. It feels like this zero sum game yeah. where if you get you get a, a plum role, that mm-hmm. actually there's someone else behind you thinking, oh, I should have Paul, had that. There was always a sense of it was almost like the opposite of an HR department because not only is it not someone there who's offer you help. When I started back in the lobby for Channel 4 News. It was just at the time, do you remember when there was the the, the spreadsheet? Yes. Yeah. The Tory yeah. spreadsheet, yeah. the yeah. whips had this spreadsheet yeah. and we we're all first really trying to get hold of it. And then you got a hold of it and we were just reading through it. And it was a list of MPs, I think it was like 33 odd MPs yeah, sort of and uh, a, list of, a list of sort of um, digressions by the side of them, sort of, you know, swords to hang over them, mm-hmm. you know. So this is, you know, it was very much, and of course, that spreadsheet was always disputed about how you know the verification of it and whether or not it actually was the Tory Whips spreadsheet. But yet, the mere fact that you have like the mythology of this spreadsheet going around, it definitely puts out the message to MPs. Like, if you have something that you're worried about, maybe do keep it to yourself because this might be used against you. Not only yeah. is there no help, but it will be proactively it, used I, against I you. I think it, it also is part of how we deal with politics as a whole, in that. I mean, you'll have heard this phrase that perception is just as important Mm. as reality in politics. And it's because of that desire of to make sure that nothing can be perceived as being bad. Then the incentive for the likes of whips and political parties is to, right, let's try and deal with this internally so that nobody finds out this is going on because this isn't going to look good. And ironically, it just makes it worse. But also, is it a a political miscalculation? Apart from the fact that it makes you very uncomfortable because there's no one you can call to discuss these issues with, you know, the enemies within and without. There's the media, of course, breathing down people's necks and so on. But also, the voters quite like a bit of human frailty, except not necessarily on the the level of what's been alleged today. I think it's really... So politics is always going to be rough and tumble. It's mm-hmm. a, it's tough. It's not fair because you can end up losing your seat when you've been a brilliant MP and lots of lots of people probably will do it this next election. But I think there's a broader point about making sure it's an environment that anyone feels they could be a successful constituency MP mm. in. Mm. And, and I go back to almost that point I made where I'd got this sense that I was too normal to be an MP. Mm. That's a bad thing. People shouldn't be looking at MPs in parliament thinking, well, if I'm if I'm not like that, somehow I'm not gonna yep. fit in. That's, I think that's for me why this matters. It's not about mollycoddling MPs. Mm. It's about making sure that the support, and I go back to when I did my tweet that I was in a same sex relationship. I hadn't discussed that with, anyone Mm -hmm. until the day I wanted to do it and I talked with my spads. You know, that to me... And you wish you had had, done it before. I had lots of friends in Parliament. You know, I did feel supported. But there are some things that are just really private to you Mm. Mm -hmm. and you feel you need to deal with them in the way that you're comfortable with. But actually, would it have been good and probably much better if I'd felt like... There was someone I could have talked mm. to. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And yet, you know, so so, so if you're me thinking that yeah. and I'm a sort of like bolted down confident, yeah. you know, person and and was happy. Yeah. Um, I can imagine if you've got something that, that you you're worried about, you know, that would there is there isn't really that broad structure. And just briefly, man, I mean, you were you were the I think the youngest MP ever when yep. you got to the House of Commons. You know, you had a lot to learn, like like all MPs, yep. but I guess especially, how old were you at the time? You 20. Were 20. I know, yeah. it's extraordinary, right? Yep. <laughs> Did you feel then that you really needed some advice about all sorts of stuff and, and you had no one to call? Um... I think I'd, I did have people I could call, but again, it, it was never anything formal. You know, it was, it, put it this way, if I was phoning someone who wasn't my mum or my wife mm. for advice, yeah. 
there was an element of risk to it, you know, and, and that was where I, as a just as an individual, had to make a judgment call of going. Right, no, I, I do. I think I can trust that person. I'm going to. It's quite a big thing to sort out, though. I, I mean, at any Absolutely. stage in your life, if Absolutely. you don't know who to trust, even within your own party. Yep. Yeah. And I suppose that's kind of what I mean about the when I'm talking about the environment of Westminster. Mm. From the get go, the minute I was in there, that's already what the the sense of the place was. Mm. Was right. I need to figure out who I can trust. Do you regret having been an MP at all? No, no, I don't. I don't. You don't either, Justin. Presumably, not I mean, you, at all. Yeah. No, I just think it could be a better place and, mm -hmm. and that would have made your experience better and I mm. think it would make more people oh. stay a little bit longer. Would you recommend it? <laughs> Absolutely. It, unless, I think unless people, as it were, from normal backgrounds mm. who are really passionate about changing things get involved, then de facto it'll stay the same. You know, it is really, really important. Um, but I also think, I actually think it's quite healthy. You know, I mm. just decided and felt I wanted a change. That's yep. what you're doing. Yeah. I do think Paul the days thinking of doing it... the same, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you're running, aren't I'm you? Out. Yeah. The <laughs> days of it being a lifetime oh. thing, because it's so yeah. intense, maybe yeah. maybe those days are over. Maybe that's a good thing, though. Maybe there's more turnover and actually it's mm. more chance mm. for more people. Okay. Can I, I'll tell you one last thing. Can I, lo can I lob a bit of balance Go in? So I, was, so I was chatting to uh, Grant Schatz, this morning, and I think we got about a whole seven words in before he mentioned Angela Rayner uh, and saying, look, this isn't just uh, an issue with uh, some indiscretions from Tory mm. MPs. I was, I kept on like hassling him about, like, no, you got seven MPs who have been, who've lost the whip yep. since since last right. parliament come in. Come on, have you got, a, as a party got a problem with sleeves? You got a whole seven words in before throwing it back at Angela Rayner. Labour have got a problem. Angela Rayner has been investigated. Mm -hmm. It does seem very much that that storyline mm -hmm. is going to be latched onto again and again and again by the Conservative Party going, for, going forward. Mm -hmm. We'll watch that space too. Well, on this podcast, we also discuss what the politicians aren't saying. And what we're not hearing is how this kind of story plays out on the ground in the constituency associations trying desperately to plan for an election, whenever that will be. OK, so, Paul. You know, you've been around the country, you've covered endless by-elections, you're going to be heavily involved in the general election. When you go from doorstep to doorstep, you know, with either with, you know, local people knocking on the door, party officials, or with the, with the MPs, imagine the doorstep now in filed in that constituency of Mark Menzies. What goes on? Well, I'm guessing it ain't going to be great. Um, I am... Stand right back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am going to stand back from that one. I went for... Um, uh, I was, I was chatting to a Tory MP um, the other day, and he was making the point to me, and you'll probably tell, him, tell me I'm wrong now, but he, he, was, he was making the point to me that the way that Westminster covers local elections, we get it completely wrong. And like the narrative at the moment now is that these local elections are gonna be really bad, and it'll get to May the 3rd, and the Tories will lost loads of seats, and that's it, lots of angry MPs are writing their letters into the 1922, and that's it, And he was saying, he said, that's it. It's not the numbers game. That's the issue for us. He said, you, you have no idea how important local associations are to us. We live and die by our associations. Mm -hmm. They're already in the, in the doldrums. Now we've got to ask them to go door knocking late at night. And it ain't great on the doorstep at the moment. And do six weeks of going on the doorstep. And it's not great. And they get to the local elections. And then loads of them will lose this because they're councillors. They'll lose their seats. And just that general malaise and depression after six months after six weeks, and then they have to go to their MP and say, well, what are you lot doing for us? And then mm -hmm. allegations, allegations which are denied, still strongly mm -hmm. disputed like today, just feed into that. They're looking at their MP saying, God, you're not making it easy for us. Yeah. Justine, tell us about your experiences of knocking on the doorsteps in genteel Putney. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you, I mean, you know, when there was a bad time for your party, did you ever feel that knock on the door? Do I really have to do this? What am I going to get at the other end of it? Do, am I up for the abuse that's coming my way? I do think that on local elections, I think you're right. I think people actually often do realise this is absolutely about who's taking out the local bins, you know, very, what happens literally when I come out of my doorstep. I think it's tinged by national though, but I think it's once you get to the general election later this year, that it makes a big difference. And, and and you asked about what it's like on the doorstep. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to stage where, I mean, people just enjoyed having a 
chat, you know, seeing as I was yeah. there, they, you yeah. know, they'd want to know what you thought about stuff. There's a list of things. This is new find <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay. So, Let's not go to number 4B. Yeah. So it sort of felt like the Rotary Club at Christmas, yeah. you know, where Father Christmas had turned up and they're like, right, seeing as you're here. Yep. So so I think, I think for us, um, we didn't get that kind of uh, negativity, but I just think it's really difficult at the moment. And I think maybe if you've got an MP that people or in two minds about, then it feeds on that especially. But if the local association feels traduced, you know, or let down or betrayed, you know, and arguably, you know, this latest case could be one of those, allegedly, um, then you've got a problem, haven't you? Because the kind of the, the machine that sustains you as a member of mm -hmm. parliament and tries to help you get re-elected is just not doing it with any conviction. Absolutely. Uh, it's, you know, MPs are in a lot of respects only as good as their campaigners, mm. <laughs> you know, it's it's not us as individuals that get ourselves elected. It's all the people who are willing to give up their time and their afternoons and their. And the local elections are the kind of testing ground for that machine, aren't they? In a big way. In, in many, especially this year. Yeah. And I think you know, I I thoroughly endorse what Maris just said. You know, I had an I had a fantastic team in Putney, but it was always changing. It was lots of young professionals. Yep. You know, people were were joining the team, leaving the team. But you had to, you had to personally lead it, and and it is about you as that most senior politician at that local level, mm -hmm. yep. showing leadership. You're out there on the doorstep with everyone else. You're out doing your leaflets with everyone else. And I think if if that trust is broken, then it will get a lot harder to genuinely, credibly lead from the front. How would you fancy going door knocking? Right now. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a nosy person, so I always quite enjoy door knocking, actually. Um, it would be quite it, interesting to find out... Worst experience knocking on doors? Worst experience? Oh, I... Stuff I, chucked in at you? I've, no, I've never had any of that, interestingly. I, um, I would say the worst experience was somebody who opened the door when they just got out of the shower. I was just going to say, that was more... the same. Do people actually do that? I've they do. Wanted... I got a bit more than I expected. <laughs> really? All oh, right. No tiles involved. <laughs> got enough. Why? Small tile. A small tile. <laughs> well, you, exactly. No. Uh, mine right. was exactly the same. Oh, really? as, uh, uh, Are you sure uh, it wasn't the same door? It can't a, be. <laughs> a dressing gown uh, that was tied a bit too loosely. <laughs> got you at a bad time, oh, so yeah. let's yes, keep this short. Yes. <laughs> and were they keen to carry on talking? This or? one was. Mine was. Yeah. To be I, fair, I he was mortified chat. when I said to him, mate, he's, oh my God, sorry. <laughs> you know, sorry. I want to just talk briefly about the, the late 90s. You probably weren't born then, so <laughs> but, uh, this is it, yeah. I, nor you, Paul, for that matter. Oh, God love you, man. Okay, anyway. <laughs> I was very oh, bored. Right, by enough flattery, but you definitely were. Oh, uh, sorry. So I, I was, I was, <laughs> Apologies, <laughs> apologies. My God, what's happened to the manners on this podcast? Quick, I have to, I have to consult my, uh, my Debrett's guide into good manners. <laughs> Never, ever mention the, name, the, the age a of a female MP. All right, got it. Um, in the 90s, the mm. Tory party was mired in sleaze. It felt like the end of days, the end of Rome, didn't it? One scandal after another. And it had a massive impact on the election outcome in 97, didn't it? Well, it combined with the fact that the party had been in power for a long time, people were ready for a change. And and I think, you know, there are some times, aren't there, where you just get this sense, that, and, and it almost feels like everything goes wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost, there's, there there's a now? zeitgeist. Are we there now? I, I think what I was thinking about um, before, before we all sat down was 2010, actually, and the fact that at that point when we were, I was in mm. opposition, mm. We were trying to get into government. We had a healthy lead over Labour, but actually MP expenses mm. was a plague on everyone's right. houses. And I think your point around the fact that actually every party has had its challenges in mm. this parliament, mm. far yeah. none, I think. Um, there is this sense of maybe way, where it plays out is a plague on everyone's houses. It, it's a it's a people And that's a really big MPs. point, isn't it? Because one of the things it's it's been borne out in opinion polls, not just in this country, but actually elsewhere in the democratic world, is that people, especially young people, are losing faith mm -hmm. in democracy. If it doesn't work for me, you know, I can't get a house I can afford, don't have a decent job, you know, public services don't work, I've, sp I've got a ton of university debt if I'm lucky enough to go into university, it's just not working out. And then this thing comes along, this sort of, you know, catalogue of sleaze, it's not exactly, you know, giving democracy a good name, is it? And mm -hmm. and and the issue behind that, in my view, is weak social mobility. It's the fact that people feel like effort and reward have got decoupled. Mm. But if that's the situation you think Britain's in, and then there are these other factors mm. that 
give you a sense of, and that's why the system's not working for mm. me because they're all busy doing X, Y, and Z instead of focused on this big issue of how I'm going to improve my prospects and my mm. future life, then yeah, that, that sort of gives you a sense that it's all focused on anything actually apart from you and your prospects. Mai, do you think there are many more 20 year olds trying to become MPs? I, I actually think there will be, yes, because uh, I, I think that particularly, I mean, this is true of every generation, but particularly um, young people today, I think, are very switched on to what's happening, yeah. you know, and, and particularly in but post... But so, so that they want to actually go into Parliament to make a difference? Yeah, I think so, because yeah. that, that's how you change it. Uh, and I suppose the other thing I would say is Westminster, I've described it before as being a bubble, and once you're in it, I think if you allow Westminster to become your entire life, which a lot of MPs do, they barely leave that building, then you very quickly become totally out of touch with what's happening mm. in the outside world. And when you've got massive issues like cost of living, like rising debt, like lack of housing, NHS falling apart, and then suddenly you're turning on Parliament to see someone, you know, saying, if you earn £15,000, you should be paying more tax. And you mm. think, I cannot afford to feed myself, never mind my children. Yeah. And you're talking about that. You know, it's no wonder people get switched off from it. Okay. But it doesn't change unless folk change and it. And I, I actually think if young people get as mobilised on people mm -hmm. as they have on planet, mm -hmm. then actually it can be a generation that really does move things forward. So let's finish with the long range forecast, just in one minute each, if you can. How is this week's big story likely to affect the upcoming general election? Paul, you first. Badly. There, I did in a second. Fantastic. Um, okay, before the generals. I need more than that. There we go. Before the generals, we've got the local elections. These ones are going to be bad. I think what a lot of people have sort of missed is that they're going to be even worse than the last few that we've missed because the last set four years ago, were actually really good for the Conservative Party. They did really well out of it. Comparatively, they're doing very badly at the moment. The local elections are going to be very, very, very bad. This story, this yet another political scandal, which is strongly refuted and, and whatever the other things the lawyers want to say, ain't going to go down well. OK, Justine? Well, it doesn't help, does it? Two weeks before local elections, especially not if you're living in Fylde. Mm -hmm. And I think for the general election, it's probably just part of that mix that maybe for many people confirms what yeah. they're already going to do. I mean, what these guys have said, but also I think it will have an impact potentially on what the actual out. Uh, the turnout of the election will be yeah. because when people are disillusioned, they're more likely to just sit at home rather Apathy, than rather vote. than anger, and that doesn't benefit anyone because yeah. if you win an election with a poor turnout, have you really won over the public? Mm. Remains to be seen. Mary Black, Justin Greening, Paul McNamara, thanks to Uri for coming here to the podcast. That's it for this week's political forecast. Goodbye. <laughs>